Welcome everyone. I'm Rita McGrath and I am so thrilled to be um, spending some time with Tom Peters, so who needs probably no introduction, but for those of you who have been under a rock for the last 25 years and do not know who Tom Peters is, he is uh, like the management guru's guru. He wrote this book. So Tom, um, this book I have owned since it was published. You can tell it's kind of yellowed. And just to show, my maiden name is still in this book. Oh, so I, I love I it. Have, I have been with this book cool. longer than I have been with my husband. My day, my day is done. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I'm taking off now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, um, I mean, In Search of Excellence has been talked about and written about and, and so forth. But what I think it did for the very first time was really bring this notion of the human side of organizations to the fore. Um, I, you know, it revolutionized the way McKinsey does business. It got a lot of people thinking. And to understand why, I think it's really valuable to go back in time to when that was published, because that was in the era of managing our way to economic decline, and the Japanese are taking over the world, yep. and America's done for. This is like 1978, 79, that kind of time frame. You know, Jimmy Carter <laughs> and all that. Yeah. And so I'd, I'd love to just hear in your words, because you, you are a relentless optimist, um, and the book, as I recall, was written to basically say, hang on, we've got excellence right here at home. Yep. Why, why do we have to depend on the Japanese to show us how this is done? Well, the first part of my answer is going to be, in the best sense of the word, to correct you. Okay. We were not the first people to talk about the people stuff. We were the first people to, in the best sense of the word, popularize it. Uh, there's a whole chapter in the book in the beginning, and it goes back to, for those who remember, you probably do, Douglas McGregor, Theory X, Theory Y, and there were people before uh, him. And so, you know, I, I have a degree in this stuff, and my thesis advisor was a royal pain in the neck about citation. And so fundamentally, we have a whole chapter about the people who do it, did it incredibly well and probably better than we did with hard boiled social psych sociology research like McGregor. So I can't take any credit for that. Okay. What the great leadership guru Warren Bennis said, and he said it, said it in the best sense of the word, sometimes the word is not used that way, is he said, we popularized it and did it in a way that connected with, if you will, real people. And, you know, a little part of it, a little tiny part of that was McKinsey, of course, believed that you'd never talk to anybody who was junior to a CEO. And my co-author, Bob Waterman and I, uh, wrote that book, We Were McKinsey People, and we did not talk to one CEO. Uh, we weren't always on the front line, but we said, look, the, the person we want in GE is a person running a $40 million division with whatever that translates into 200. We, we, want, we want real people who are dealing with real problems. That's pretty senior itself. Um, but the, re the real deal, and I think it's the reason we're talking, is I am now about 200 years old, otherwise translated as 77, and I have been saying the same damn, I, I said to somebody, look, I love royalties, buy all 17 of my books, I'll be happy, but the reality is they all say the same thing. And, you know, that's not much of an exaggeration. And you're right. We said, put people first. Mm -hmm. And in my, in my view, Rita, I don't know what's going to happen, not only because of my age in 2045, but I know that to get to 2045, we have to get through next week in the next five years. And my whole belief is that in the midterm, short term, humanism and a people, I don't know what AI is going to do in 2045. Nobody will have a job and so on. But in the mid, short to mid to longish term, 
uh, those who put people first will be the great performers. And, you know, the translation in part, which is something I've been talking about for many years, uh, is great design, human design, design that connects. Uh, and I believe, you know, there was, there's a guy who I quote, who's a British design company person, and he says, only one company can be the low cost company, all the rest have to compete on design. And I think that's a slight exaggeration, but you know, not, not much of an exaggeration. Well, and so, so this brings me to this book. And yeah. in this book, you talk a lot about, and I've got lots of colorful sticky notes and things in it. Um, but one of the things- Thank, that thank really, you for the sticky notes. <laughs> Don't you love it? Even if you faked it and put them in this morning, it makes me feel good. No, I've been, I've been, I've been. I've, I, I, one of the things that I think is very, so interesting about that book is how personal it is. You know, that you talk, for example, about the Navy and uh, being told, you know, you got your gold star and you show up and you're an officer and your chief of command says, listen to your chiefs. Absolutely. And well, thought, there are two, there are two things. There are two things. Uh, yes. I mean, the, for those who know the military, well, you don't need to know the military, the, the Navy part. A lot of people probably don't know about chief petty officers, but everybody knows about sergeants. And, you know, our one liner, and this is really important to our conversation, is sergeants run the Army, chief petty officers run the Navy, and the single biggest determinant in the organization of everything is the front line manager. You know, my one liner is any idiot can be a vice president, but to be a good front line manager is really a pretty amazing thing. And, you know, and, and, the, and the other research which is tied to that or supports it is, and this is so consistent and so clear worldwide uh, and it is a one-liner, but it happens to be true. People don't leave companies, they leave managers. You know, you may be in the world's crappiest company, but if you're my boss and you treat me well, uh, the odds are, short of us doing dishonest things as a company, that I'm going to stick around. And, you know, there's a whole list that says productivity, quality, da 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 The principal determinant is the first-line manager. And my bias, and I suspect you would agree with me, is that we worry about getting good frontline managers, but we do not do what I argue, and that is your complete portfolio of frontline managers is corporate asset number one. And that is as true for a car dealership that has only four departments as it is for some giant organization with 400. But I'm a rabbit on the topic of frontline managers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, strikes me as, as being interesting, maybe a little worrying, um, since In Search of Excellence was published, is we've seen a couple of trends. Um, one is the widespread prevalence of what I'll just call bad jobs, you know, just jobs Irregular hours, poor pay, no room for advancement, treating people like badly performing robots, basically. Um, second is this tour of duty career idea, where instead of developing as a frontline manager, you know, you kind of go on three year cycles from firm to firm. And I was talking to um, an entrepreneur, a woman entrepreneur um, some weeks ago, and she said, you know, the trouble is by the time the company's looking for people in their 30s to take on those jobs, those people have moved on, you know, they're elsewhere. And I, I, I just can't get over the idea that somehow we've made a wrong turn somewhere in this, the way that we deploy uh, human capital. Uh, yeah, obviously the so-called gig economy is the epitome of that. Uh, well, I think it's been going on longer than that. Uh, lifetime employment was the norm, maybe not. I think it was when we did In Search of Excellence, which was 82. And I remember when I switched, my father worked for the same company for 44 years. Where did he work? I remember when I switched jobs, time number one, he was just, he wasn't infuriated, but he was 
oh my god you know you mean you're gonna have two jobs in your lifetime so you know this 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 thing has been going on for a long time here's my only disagreement with your entrepreneur pal I once put together uh, everything I knew I give speeches with slides and I ended up with a one four thousand and ninety six slide long presentation with a hundred thousand words of annotation and statistically speaking four thousand slides one of them's got to be first and the one I put in first came from the crazy entrepreneur Richard Branson and it said businesses have have to give people enriching, rewarding lives, or they're not worth doing. So I think maybe in finding that talent, your entrepreneur friend has a problem, uh, but once she gets a reasonably decent set of people, it's in her hands and it's her responsibility and I believe that approached right uh, per Mr. Branson, I can hold on to somebody for a pretty long period of time. Uh, so, and, and you know, again, I, I don't know what I'm talking about in part because given the new technology, and of course we're, you know, wor wor working from home has changed everything at some extent overnight. And it also, weakens certain kinds of interpersonal bonds. So to some extent, that means loyalty even goes further down the tubes. Uh, but I think I can hold on to people if I really, first and foremost, am focused on their future. Uh, if I help them get better, well, there's some, somebody said, and it is one of those one-liners. If you care about what they care about, then they'll care about what you care about. And I believe, given the changes, that the number one job of every employer is to make sure that every human being who works for them, even if it's a temporary assignment, walks out of that assignment as a better per a person, better prefer better prepared for the future than they were eight weeks ago. You know, a thousand years ago when he was, you know, between Steve Jobs' tenure, John Scully run at, ran Apple Computer and he wrote a book about it. And he said... Odyssey, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said, I can't promise you a job for life. I can't promise you a job for a year. I can't promise you a job for six months. But I can promise you that whatever period of time you work for us, you will have learned more of value than you could have any other place in the world. And, you know, that's a very powerful statement. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not looking to return to the past, but, you know, I just think creating superb, excellent organizations is doable in 2020. And it probably will in 2030. And who the hell knows what's going to happen. I was just talking to somebody before you and I started this conversation. And we were talking about interpersonal relationships and talking about something that a lot of people have said. Uh, certainly, I'm not the first or 1,000s. And that is young men and women who were born after the iPhone arrived God only knows what relationships will be about and what they'll be like. As you know, as well as I do, and it even happens with, you know, with people your age or my age, uh, where you have a conversation and the person is constantly looking at their iPhone the entire time and not looking at you. And then there are these, to me, horrible things about percentage of people <laughs> of a certain age, I guess teenagers, who, who sleep with their iPhones under their pillow. And they're ridiculous numbers, like 60 or So I don't know. In other words, I don't know what a human relationship is when you started with the iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to find out in the next 20 years, I guess, what that's all about. 
Well, it's a grand uh, social experiment, right? Um, yeah. it, it hijacks a lot of our attention. Um, yeah. I was struck with your, um, your, your uh, dedication of the most recent book, um, Herb Kelleher, Richard Branson, Anita Roddick. Um, and it just strikes me that all of those, all of those, of course, business school case studies and, you know, uh, really, really well known, but they were the first, it, it didn't look obvious when they first started, the yeah. success that would later come. I mean, each of those people had ideas that everybody looked at and thought, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So do you see anything in common among those folks that, that would be? Oh, yeah. Um, I adored Anita and got to know her reasonably well and her death at an early age was tragic. I don't know whether you ever heard about it, but she died of AIDS, but she died of AIDS because of a blood transfusion that she'd had 10 years earlier. Didn't and that was just, that's about as tragic as it gets. Didn't know that. But let's talk about Kelleher who died this past year sad to say, and he became a reasonably good friend. Uh, he, he said, your employees are your first customer. And I remember the one liner that, not one liner, whatever it is, I remember Herb told me this, I don't know if it was in a book or not, but he said, do you know what my greatest pleasure in life is as a CEO? And I said, Herb, I have not got a sweet clue. He <laughs> said, I like writing handwritten letters to customers who have abused one of my employees to tell them that they are no longer welcome to fly Southwest Airlines. And that's a damn powerful statement, you know? And, you know, he, he really believed that. And he had a wonderful uh, president by the name of Colleen Barrett. And Colleen was, you know, his equal in that regard. I got to know her a little bit. And so, Whenever I had personal problems, I called Colleen. If you can fix a place with thousands of people, you sure as hell can fix me. Um, but, and to, to a surprising degree, Southwest has held on to that, I believe. Uh, while most of the other airlines, unfortunately, have gone in the opposite direction. Uh, but the, the person I was talking to, right, you know, having a meeting conversation with right before you uh, is in healthcare. And one of my favorite books, don't remember the author's name recently that came out uh, was called putting the patient second. And, you know, the bottom line is if you want to put the patient first, then you've got to put the person who serves the patient even more first to mm -hmm. abuse the language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just, think that's the name of the game. And, and, and let me just say something that's shockingly important. And most people who are watching us are not CEOs of giant companies, but we had a horrible anniversary this week. This was the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's article in the New York Times, yes. which put maximizing shareholder value at the top of the list and said, all excuses the language forthcoming, all that social responsibility stuff is bullshit. Mm -hmm. And there was wonderful research done by my old friends at McKinsey a couple of years ago and I identify McKinsey because if they did the research, it's likely to be pretty solid. And it was about 600 companies and those who invested for the short term and those who invested for the long term. And over a 25 year period, the long term investors beat the crap out of the maximized shareholder value crowd. So we now have the numbers, we know the dollars and cents figures, uh, longer term investment works, but you have to have nerve. I remember I was talking to a guy who ran a um, four or five billion dollar public uh, electronics component company, and we were just chatting before a speech. And he said, Well, he said, I told my board of directors that if they would like me to increase profitability by 50% in the next 12 months, I could do it 
without raising a sweat. He said, but I told them they'd have to hire somebody else because I won't do it. You know, you cut the cost, you quit investing in R&D, and the numbers look fabulous for six or eight or nine or 12 or 18 months, uh, and then the place literally falls apart. So, uh, you know, the Bransons, the Kellehers, the Roddicks were special. Anita was terrific, too, you may remember, was she had, I don't know whether required is the right word, but it's pretty close. Each of her store employees was required to do public service stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I think, on a weekly basis. And, you know, I thought that, let me just tell you one other little story. Um, a couple of guys who were good friends of mine, whose names I don't remember, that's what happens when you're my age, uh, <laughs> wrote a wonderful book called, which everybody who is watching us must buy immediately, uh, Management Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we all probably know, when those lists of best healthcare organizations come along, often is not, more often than not, Mayo's at the top. So there are a million things in the book, but there was one thing that just really knocked my socks off. Rita, you are one of the world's top 10 pediatric cardiologists, and you are applying for job at Mayo. And I'm interviewing you for that job. And you and I have a half an hour discussion. And what you don't know is that either with a pen on my hand or however you do it in today's world, during that half an hour, I am literally, not figuratively, counting the number of times that you use the word we and the number of times that you use the word I. And if the we's beat the I's, then the godlike Rita don't get the job. And you know, it goes back a hundred years. That, you know, uh, I don't remember his first name, but Dr. Mayo, the first Dr. Mayo, uh, wrote this thing in 1914 that said, we will practice team medicine. And that's been the deal all along. And there was a doctor who was hired a while back, I can't remember her name, who's quoted in the book. And she said, I am 100 times more powerful in this job than I was in my last job because I'm working with the whole organization. I love that. The we, we versus I thing just gives me that's, chill. That's amazing. That is yeah. amazing. Uh, Apparently, just it's, you know, it's, it's as, as they used to say or still say, God's truth by God. <laughs> for, for our listeners who may not know, we were just talking about Anita Roddick, who was the founder and basically creator of The Body Shop. And uh, what was so revolutionary about what she was doing at the time was she looked at the cosmetics industry as it existed and basically completely deconstructed it. No advertising, uh, recycled plastic bottles to put her ingredients in, um, and very clever use of, like she did require everybody to do community service, but send me your press clippings, right? So I don't just want you to do community service in a, in a cave somewhere. I want yeah. people to be noticing that you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very clever. Very, very clever. Um, yeah. So, well, and those people were... You know, I, uh, I, I don't know Branson. I met him once for about two seconds, but uh, Kelleher and Roddick were just the most decent human beings in the world. Uh, and you or I could have had a conversation with them the same way you could have had a conversation, whatever, with a checkout clerk at a grocery store. Totally. Totally. So um, Herb was kind enough to come to a strategic management society. And you know what those were like, you know, huge meeting. And he was kind enough to come as a guest speaker. And uh, so we actually rented a mobile bar for him and stocked it with wild, and we stocked it with wild turkey. We stocked it with wild turkey. Yeah. <laughs> and he did his interview, you know, liberally sipping on the wild turkey and sort of espousing his business. Well, I don't know how long your interview was, but if it went on for more than 15 minutes, he also took a smoke break. <laughs> Oh, I have blooms of smoke. Yeah, no, I went to the video thing with him, and it was absolutely hilarious. He was, he was, he's, he's, uh, it was an amazing, amazing uh, person. He's a liar! So get over all your lawyer prejudices. Lawyers can be like that, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> he started, that's right. He started out as a lawyer. He didn't even yeah. found the company. I'd forgotten that. Speaking, speaking of lawyers, uh, my favorite lawyer or lawyer trained person uh, is Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet. Yes. And I think Quiet is my top business or management or leadership book so far in the 21st century. Uh, and Quiet says that we undervalue 50% of the population, i.e. introverts, uh, and that's stupid. And it's stupid in part because the quiet ones are demonstrated to be better leaders. They tend to be more thoughtful, and we blow them off. I mean, the, or the research he was showing was if you're noisy, you're considered to be more physically attractive. You are considered to be smarter. You are considered to be more clever. I mean, God help the introverted person who has asked the question, and they actually think for 15 seconds before they answer. But I just, I just love, 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 love that book. And she started something. She's head of an organization. It's called the Quiet Revolution, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I just, I, I said to her, I was talking to her one time, and I, she was on the same program that I was, and I said, let me ask you a question, Susan. Did you write that book entirely for the purpose of making me feel like a jerk? <laughs> and we had a lovely conversation because I did. I felt like an idiot. I don't think I'm a total sap for loud mouths, but. You know, relative to what she was saying, I was more than willing to acknowledge that the quiet ones often get the short end of the stick and, you know, you're, you're bypassing 50% of the population and they are better at what they do. Well, and you for a long, long time have said, just building on the notion of quiet, um, that we need more women leaders. And I had a uh, Thomas Chamorro for music um, in a conversation a few weeks ago. And his point is we often confuse confidence with competence. And he uses this wonderful example. He says, imagine trying to make a photo documentary about Angela Merkel's day. <laughs> you know, you get, she gets up in the yeah. morning. She has coffee with her husband. She prepares for meetings. She goes to well-prepared meetings where decisions get made. She comes home. Like, what is interesting about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh, no, I, I, it's funny. I'm going to look away from you, which is rude, and see if I can find a piece of paper. And by God, oh, I'm not going to read all this. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Faff, P-F-A-F-F. -F -F. And I, I am going to, I'm not going to waste a lot of time, but I'm going to take a minute to read through this. The Faff study conducted over a five-year period shows significant differences in the leadership skill levels practiced by male and female managers. The study included 2,482 managers, 1,727 males, 755 females, at all levels from 459 organizations. Employees rated female managers higher than male managers in 17 out of the 20 skill areas assessed, 15 at a statistically significant level. Uh, men and women tied in the other three areas. Bosses rated female managers higher than male managers in 16 of the 20 skills areas, and all 16 were statistically significant. Faf being quoted, our first two studies challenged the conventional wisdom that women are only better at softer skills, such as communicating, empowering people, and being positive. This new study using data over five-year period once again indicates that that conventional wisdom is wrong. The statistical significance of this data is dramatic, says Mr. Pfaff. Over a five-year period while gathering data on more than 2,400 subjects, men are not rated significantly higher by any of the raters in any of the areas measured. Uh, and my apologies for looking down and That's reading, fine. but damn it, it's worth it. Um, I mean, you know, the evidence, the evidence is there. There's a quote I used that came from Nicholas Kristof in the uh, New York Times. And he said, I've forgotten, gosh, I wish I could recall the word, but his fundamental words were research by McKinsey 
shows that if you want to get ahead, promote more women. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, you know, I, I said to people from the beginning when I started talking about this, which is actually 1996 and it has a specific date. And I said, listen, I don't care whether you are a social activist or whether you're a misogynist. Hire more women and your organ. You know, I hope you're a social activist, but I don't care at a professional level. Hire more women and the organizations will be better. Mm -hmm. It was, again, I, I don't want to waste our precious time, but this thing started in 1996. Uh, I had a woman who was running my training company and she came up to me. This was in Palo Alto. And she said, Tom, there's a meeting in Boston two weeks from now and you'll be there. And I said, yes, Heather, whatever you say. <laughs> and she had gathered this group of, of extraordinary women, uh, 10 or 12, a woman who's the most senior person in the Disney organization, a woman by the name of Judy George, who started a company called Domain Home Fashions that was incredibly successful for a long period of time. My favorite, how she got her, I don't know was the first woman driver in the Indi in Indianapolis 500. And, and these eight or 10 women uh, lectured me without raising their voices for two hours on how totally full of crap I was relative to what I didn't understand relative to women as leaders, women as purchasers, and so on. And it was one of the top 10 days of my life and professional life in many respects. Um, and so I've been a champion of that for some 25 years from now, from that 25 years past. And as I said, for the social justice reasons, absolutely positively, unequivocally, but from the business performance issues, you're not, you don't have to be, you don't have to be an altruist, uh, to buy into this stuff. Totally. Totally. Well, I know you've been reading uh, Zainab Tan's work on a good job strategy. And, you know, to me, the whole, um, inclusion agenda is um, very profound. And there's, a, there's an avalanche of research that says if you have more diverse and included um, leaders that you're just gonna be a better organization. Well, there's a guy by the name of Scott Page who wrote a book, the title of which I can't remember, but I remember the one liner that I use. And it said, this is a big sentence. Three words, diversity trumps ability. And he would use these groups and they would be faced with complex issues. And the groups that were, you know, complex, uh, fundamentally had diversity on every, every flavor. I, I call it lowercase d diversity, uh, not gender, not race, but you know, you've got one person with a PhD from MIT, and you have one person who was a boat builder in Maine. And, uh, you know, and, and that, that's, that really is the key. And, well, and I think particularly with my design bias is I said, listen, every department in the organization, purchasing HR, I don't care. Uh, you, need, you need a history major. You need a music major. You need a theater major. You need a shaman. You need people who really come at the world from dramatically different ways. And again, uh, it's a lovely thing to do, comma, and it pays off. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that you, um, you have what you call the squint test. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, my squint test, uh, I'm pretty proud of that, <laughs> is uh, you give me a photograph of your executive team. Uh, <laughs> and I will squint. And my squint test is, does the composition of the team look roughly like the market being served? Uh, and if it doesn't, you got a business problem. Uh, and you know, the statistics on, on women purchasing power is just absolutely insane. Uh, women buy something like 85% of consumer products, healthcare products, financial service products. But the part I really like is for the, certainly women have not made it into the very top levels of organizations at the levels that they should. But when you go down a couple of levels, women now constitute over 50% of purchasing managers. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the way I like to put it 
is she is as likely to sign the RFP for a five-year, $5 billion IT outsourcing contract as she is to, to choose the location of the family vacation. Absolutely. And, and then I get to do my other rant. Well, sure. The other rant is old people. <laughs> what about old people? Um, I mean, old people will say 50 plus. Oh, I mean, this is a one liner, but it has to be true. Old people do not have the money. They have all the money. And then you do the subtext of that. And older women have all the money. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, was, there was one thing I saw that said over the next five years or something like that, 20 trillion plus dollars of assets in the U.S. alone will be transferred to women. Number one, your people, even if they haven't made it to the CEO slot, uh, have higher and higher levels of jobs. So the income goes up. And the other, pe other thing for old people is my people, called males, uh, do the favor of dying seven years earlier. And so the wealth transfer that goes to women is just insanely high. And, and I, well, I'm not being fair, but I'm not being unfair. Uh, 31 year old product, average age product teams can't design products for me. Sorry, obviously exceptions to the rule. Uh, and, 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 you know, they're, they're wonderful. I love a one-liner that changes my whole perspective on life. And the one-liner in this topic that I love came from the guy who used to head AARP, as he said, and our colleagues who are watching need to listen carefully to this, at the age of 50, you have 50% of your adult life still ahead of you. You didn't know your left foot for the right until you were 25. And when you're 50, you've got 35 years ahead of you. And 25 of those years are healthy. And you're at your prime income level. And when you get up to 65 or so, the, the mortgage is paid off. The kids are out of university. And so you have that holy of holies called discretionary income. But it is so stupid. Uh, I met a woman by the name of Mar Marty Barletta, uh, Martha Barletta, Barletta, and we actually then co-authored a little teeny book years ago. Uh, but my favorite title and the book is her book called Prime Time Women, and it is just fabulous. And it and it talks you know it talks about this market. Uh, but I mean, if people want something concrete on it, the, the, about that 50-50, which I love, the average American buys 13 cars in his or her adult lifetime. Seven of those cars are bought after the age of 50. Wow. Uh, and there's not a car company on earth that understands it. I mean, and it's deep stuff. The, the way I like to say it, this is not about a program. This is not about an old people's policy. This is about strategic reorientation. It is not about putting some old fart my age in a photograph of a new Chevrolet. That ain't the point. It is a reorientation of everything, including the processes and the HR stuff and every other darn thing. And the same thing is true with the women's issue. I just love the pattern. It is not the women's initiative for 2021. It is not the old folks initiative for 2021. It is a strategic reorientation of the enterprise. Reason why is old people, women are the market. We worry ourselves to death about the millennials and God bless the millennials, but they do have a problem if you're selling things to them that has ain't got no money. No. I got the money. <laughs> and since I'll go seven years earlier than my wife, then she'll have the money in addition to the money she already had from her business life. Well, I think you're absolutely right on that. But um, let's come back to the millennials for a minute, because I think it is, and, and it to me, it ties together with the whole Milton Friedman argument, which is um, my uh, my colleague, uh, Bill Lazonic, who you may know, he's with you. Oh, my God, is he a colleague? Oh, my God, he's God. <laughs> he's, isn't he amazing? No, no, oh, my God. I, I have written 100 things, and 
I quote him all the time and his most horrible statistic about how much money we used to spend on employees and how little we do now. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. going to reach out and give you an extra hug because that's cool. That you know it's very cool. So for those, I, of you don't, I don't know anything from his writings, but I, you know, he, he makes my life easy because he makes it a lot easier well, to make the points that I care about. He's got all the data. I mean, so he's got a pretty recent book. I think it came out last year called Predatory Value Extraction. I mean, this guy does not mess around. Um. I love it. Yeah, the, the article in the HBR that he had was Profits Without Profits. Prosperity. Yes. And yes. that was the one that introduced me to him. Oh, really? You're really yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, a, he's an amazing, thoughtful person. Um, the The kind of work he's doing, though, is really looking very carefully at the whole mayor's nest of buybacks, you know, the, the sort of diversion of corporate resources, the unwillingness to invest in employees, la, 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 la. Um, and in a way, I think Friedman's work was basically, you know, a, a, a smokescreen behind which all this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Out. No, I'm, I'm, and I know it's hyperbole. I'm willing to say that Friedman was the most dangerous human being who's been alive in the last 50 years. Um, and obviously that can be challenged and I'd even be willing to challenge it. But the, the, the number that I remember from your friend, Mr. Lozonic, was he said in 1970, this was the 50th anniversary this week of the Friedman article, in 1970, 50% of corporate profits went to workers, R&D, and other capital investments. 40 years later, I think the research was 2015, 9%. 9% went to employees. Are, I mean, that is just, if that article does not make you, if that set of numbers does not make you physically ill, then, uh, you know, I've got a problem with you. And, of course, you can't blame it all on Friedman. You can blame it. Friedman and then his acolyte at the Harvard Business School by the name of Michael Jensen, who is just as bad, though not as powerful. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it makes, make, I, let's see if I can have, I did write something that was inspired by him. I love understated, understatement. I'm famous for it. Maximize. <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me take a note of that. <laughs> Maximizing shareholder value, 1970 to question, question, question. The morally bankrupt, incomparably destructive economic and social idea that decapitated modern business. That's kind of a cool topic, isn't That's it? That's awesome. There's, there's the cover. I, I, I don't know whether the article's worth a damn, but I was really happy with the title. That's fantastic. Well, it's been something I've I've been you know frustrated about for years, and and sort of began to be frustrated about it because I focus on innovation, and you know we, you just over and over and over again these corporate guys would tell you, oh, I can't possibly invest in an innovation yeah. that's not going to pay off for three or four years, and it, you know like you're like, well, what are you investing in? You know, yeah, and it's and it's well, this, this piece has. If I can find it quickly, if I can't find it quickly, I will not bore you to death. Uh, no, it's something else. Yeah, here's, here's what I love. Uh, the McKinsey research I mentioned before. 2001 to 2015, and there are a whole bunch of measures that distinguish between the two. 167 long-term investors versus 448 short-term investors. And listen to these numbers. Average company revenue, short-termers plus, sorry, long-termers plus 47%. Average company earnings, long-termers plus 36%. Average market capitalization, long-termers plus 58%. And then my favorite, average job creation, plus 132 percent uh you know so you just i i well and the, and the other sinner who now has recanted when it doesn't make a damn bit of dip while he's passed away as of last year was jack welsh at ge uh jack was the poster child for that 
And, uh, you know, then in his last few years, he said it was a stupid idea, but... The dumbest you know, idea ever, right? Dumbest <laughs> idea ever, yeah. 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 Well, I, it stopped mattering. Yeah. Well, there's, um, there's a venture capitalist, um, you may know of him, Nick Hanauer, who... Um, no, I'm afraid I don't. Okay, yeah. So he's, um, he, he, he runs a blog called Pitchfork Economics. And so uh, a few years ago, he had a very oh, famous... Yeah, TED, yeah. yeah he had a very famous TED Talk and... Um, uh, just published a piece out in Time Magazine. And this is what I thought was interesting. He said, if the income distribution that was in place in post-World War II America was in place today, that the bottom 90% of all wage earners would be $51 trillion richer than they are right now. Um, and, you know, just think about that $51 trillion in your pocket in the economy. Yeah. And what an impact that would have. Yeah, because, I mean, the things that without getting political, uh, the things that are distressing us politically are pretty inarguably driven by the insane level of inequality. Yes. Uh, and you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a presidential election or pretty much anything else. And the, the inequality is not supportable. I think it's a black, some of the investment bankers on, in, in uh, Manhattan are starting to say, uh, you know, re reluctantly, which isn't quite fair. Well, Business Roundtable last year made a declaration that said, you know, the Friedman idea maximizing short-term shareholder value is, is, is uh, it ain't working. Well, but the, yeah. cat is, the, cat, the cat is out of the barn or the hen is out of the barn or whoever it is in the barn is out of the barn relative to that. Yeah, but the, the, Wall, Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal did a pretty um, damning analysis of that uh, statement by the Business Roundtable, and what they did was the, these reporters went and looked at every single company that had signed on, and not yeah. all the members signed on. We don't we forget that there's a whole chunk of them that never never signed up, uh, and and basically went to the the companies and said, well, did you run this by your board? The theory being, if you're going to have a fundamental shift in how you do business, yeah. that's clearly a board level decision, a board level responsibility. Um, and I think it was like five of them that said, yeah, the board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, you're right on the money. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of empty space in that business round table. But I'll still give him one percent for even saying any frigging thing that challenged him. So, what do you think unravels this? I mean, you know, one of the things I think, if there's anything that good that comes out of this pandemic, is we've had a great unfreezing. I mean, there are things on the table now that even seven months ago wouldn't have been conceivable. I mean, do you see a path to kind of riding this ship somehow, getting more humanity in our C-suites, putting more resources in the pockets of ordinary people, kind of getting a more equitable sense of, you know, the spoils of corporate largesse <laughs> kind of thing? Uh, I can't say anything more than I hope so. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hope the dramatic nature of what we're going through uh, will lead to a shift in that direction. And I've spent the last couple or several months trying to talk about that topic. Uh, it's very hard to be completely optimistic, that's for sure. Uh, I want to, I know I'm picking pieces of paper up and reading. Okay. To you. What, <laughs> I love having a peek at your desk. It's great. What, like, no, I laid all this stuff out before talking to you. Um, so this is where I get crude and rude. Uh, and I genuinely believe this for leaders at any level. The way leaders at any level behave during this six months, one year pandemic the way they behave will define the quality of their adult life as a human being. You know, this is the ball game, my dearly beloved friends. And so I wrote this thing that I call uh, the COVID Leadership Seven Commandments. And my seven commandments are be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be present, be positive, walk in the other person's shoes. And 
I don't think it is pie in the sky. I desperately hope that it will stick. Uh, but yeah, I you know I I don't know what the rules are in these conversations, but I'm going to push the limit a little bit. I've said I can, you know, I just gave you those seven things. I said I can summarize my whole response to you as a leader during COVID-19. Don't be an asshole. And, you know, my apologies for the use of such a word in a public place, but it's the right word. It is. And, uh, you know, this, this, is where you, this is where you shine uh, or, or not as, as an individual. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, you were talking about the business roundtable thing and, you know, the action has been a lot less than the words. Uh, there have been an awful lot of people, including a lot of incredibly rich Silicon Valley people who have used fabulous language and then not done a damn thing for their employees. And that infuriates me because I was a Palo Alto resident for 30 years. So, um, speaking taking, of which, taking there, speaking of Palo Alto, yes, uh, climate change, racial injustice, sorry, racial injustice, pandemic, and climate change. And uh, economic, and economic yeah. crisis. I loved it that the governor of California was swearing in a press conference last week, and he was swearing at the climate change deniers. And I just thought it was fabulous. I, I know Mr. Newsom just a teeny bit, and I laughed hysterically, you know, and clapped even more hysterically when he said it. But if we don't understand that these extreme events are increasing in frequency, um, you got a little head problem. I, I do want to say something. As a boy who grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, was born in 42, which was deep south uh, at the time, uh, and incredibly segregated. Uh, I was, boy, I don't want to overdo it. I was reasonably heavily involved in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. I actually taught the first course at Stanford on the topic. Uh, I have been, I don't know about you, Rita, but I have been gobsmacked, to use Anita Roddick's favorite word, by what I didn't know relative to racial inequality. Gobsmacked, ashamed of myself. I mean, I'm not totally stupid, but as I said to somebody, I thought we'd nail it when we got the Civil Rights Act passed. And, you know, we're not only not on third base, we ain't got the first base at this point. And, uh, you know, the, the time has come again relative to that, I hope. But I'm just, I'm a wreck over this. And I do want to say something, and, you know, my suspicion is that the people who are watching us are probably kind of believe the sorts of things that I think you and I believe. Uh, but any white person who doesn't believe in white privilege is a complete, total idiot. You know, I mean, I said to people, I've had a successful career. Would you like to know why? Number one issue, careful selection of my parents. <laughs> Uh, you I got a tweet about that. <laughs> white male Protestant, which mattered back in the 40s, white male Protestant American of intelligent parents. That was the first 99.8%. And that's not, that's not, I don't really think it is hyperbole. And, you know, we'll stick with the first two, one which is very personal to you, white male. That's an awful lot of the ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 if, and if you don't get that, not meaning you, if you don't understand that, then I got some really serious problems with you. I think that is compelling, very compelling. And like you, I just have been stunned at how much I didn't know.
in yeah. the home. It's and embarrassing. You and I are supposed to be the, the, the smart people, if you will. We're, we're counseling other people in our writings and our speaking. And well, you know, the first step that, to wisdom is knowing what you don't know, right? <laughs> or yeah, learning no, what you don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 the two little stories that was going to start to say I like, but that's not the word you use. The two tiny ones that uh, was, this wasn't in Minnesota. I've forgotten where it was and I should remember. Uh, one of the places where there was a huge and horrendous uh, misbehavior toward an African-American or a black the, the, the little story I loved, which was so descriptive, is in this town, some white guy got, took a television set and walked around town with a television set, which had he been African American would have called forth the cops. And he said, I walked around town for two hours with a television set not only was nobody ever critical, but dozens of people said, oh, you're struggling, let me carry it for you. Oh my God. And, you know, and the other one, the other one which I loved and hated, you may have seen the piece, it was an African, I don't know, I still, I, I don't know whether I'm supposed, to, I'm allowed to use African-American, African-American, black, whatever, uh, woman, female, surgeon. And the article was why I wear my scrubs all day long. And, you know, she, I remember her saying, she said, if I, for the first time in my life, when my scrubs are on, I can walk through a high end retail store without being perceived as somebody who's trying to steal. Wow. I mean, it that was just, so, that is so moving. That yeah, is. it really is. And, and, uh, uh, it's, it's all, it's, I uh, just, um, as I said, I'm just, stunned by my ignorance and and more than a little bit pissed off at myself <laughs> well it shows you're growing and learning right yeah i guess so i mean it, it would have been nice if it had been a little bit earlier Better but now I, than never, right? I said i i uh joe biden who i call young joe because he's 13 days younger than i am uh uh if I were running for the job he's running for as a boy who was born in Annapolis, and if I were required to tell you, and this is, if I was required to tell you the number of times I used the N word, I couldn't have won a single primary. And I mean, it was sure it was ignorance and sure I was a kid, but I just and blown away. By the way, I have a commandment for all the people who are watching us. And I was thinking of the tear part because I always tear up. Uh, you know, I have, have these tick diseases and they thought it was something worse and so on. So I spent a fair amount of time in healthcare organizations. If you deal with anybody in a healthcare organization, getting an x ray, getting blood drawn, please do me a favor. Look them in the eye and tell them, thank you for what you are doing. It is incredible. And I tear up, you know, I'm doing it with you. I tear up every time I say it. And I said to one woman, I said, I was in Vietnam. Hello? She did Okay, um, no, we're cool. We're getting there. Uh, at any rate, I, where was I? Uh, you were in Vietnam? Yeah, I was in Vietnam. I said, I was in Vietnam and it meant that people may have shot at me every couple of days. I said, people shoot at you every day, mm -hmm. you know, and literally mask on or no mask on. And, and I just, I just, I'm not proud of those people. I mean, it's the wrong word. I just, I just think it's, I think it's incredible what, what they're doing and, and I, I know we recognize it a little bit, but we don't recognize it enough. It's, I think it needs to be personal. So I, I hear the rum, 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 rumblings that uh, our time is coming to an end. Um, where would you like to direct people who want to learn more? Uh, wow. You've got an exclamation point as your corporate logo, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to direct them to my stuff. Uh, <laughs> 
I want to direct them to some of these books. There are a whole bunch of books. Wish I had the list in front of me uh, on the problems of meritocracy, the problems of privilege. Uh, you know, don't worry about my stuff. I do hope you read it, uh, et cetera. And it does talk about the people stuff and the other things. But I, I want you to – Warren Buffett – said his number one secret to success is reading. And my mom, God bless her, uh, turned me into a reader by the age of five. And my number one secret to success is reading. So relative to these issues, uh, please inform yourself uh, and, and really make it a personal strategic priority. Uh, ignorance is not required. There are, uh, per your comment about Mr. Lozonic, there are good and readable books out there uh, on, on, this, on this topic. And so study your buns off and uh, <laughs> get smart about it because there's no excuse not to. That's great wisdom. I so enjoyed that hour just flew and uh, lovely to see you and yeah, uh, to be continued. And I hope you well, feel better. It was a fabulous conversation and thank you very much for your time and thank you for your invitation. Thank you.